This is Josh here from Inside Wrestling Truth, and today's guest is Billy the P. Billy, how you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. All right, Billy. First, tell us where you're from and how you got into the business. Uh, I'm born and raised in Louisville. Been here all my life. Um, and as far as uh, getting into the business, um, you know, I grew up like any, anybody else in this area. That you know, it's my age. I grew up watching. Memphis Wrestling, so, you know, my heroes were you know, Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Austin Idol, you know, all those guys, Jimmy Hart, later I took it, you know, I got an appreciation for Jimmy Hart later on, and then as I got older, you know, I started watching when WWF went mainstream, and, you know, watching Bobby Heenan, and, and that's how I knew, you know, watching them, I you know, I love to be a manager, you know, that, that seemed like the life for me, and it seemed like something I wanted to do, so, um, you know, I, I, you know, it was something I dreamed of, but I never pursued it. Um, you know, I didn't know really how to go about it. Um, so fast forward a few years, um, you know, in the mid nineties, my friends and I were going down to Louisville Gardens a lot. Uh, we were going down every Tuesday, basically for a while and watching the shows down there. And in the summer of 95, um, Ian Rotten had just, you're, you know, depending on who you believe, you know, he was fired or he left ECW and Ian moved here to Louisville to be with his girlfriend. And um, he started coming down to Louisville Gardens on Tuesdays and putting out flyers where he was putting on little spot shows around town, around you know, southern Indiana. So he was putting out flyers and just, you know, just kind of happened that we kind of met him and, you know, kind of got to know him. You know, a couple of friends of mine you know, got in good with him and started talking to him. Eventually, they started talking me into, hey, you got to come out and hang out with Ian. We'll sit around and watch videos and, you know, things like that. So, um, eventually, you know, Ian and myself started to become friends. And, um, you know, in uh, 96, when he decided he was going to finally put his own promotion together, that's when he came to me and said, how would you like to be my heel manager? And, you know, I, you know, I never, I can't recall ever, telling him I had, you know, specific desire to be in the business. You know, I never, you know, I don't recall ever making that known to him. But, right. you know, I guess he saw, you know, he saw something in me that he wanted, he thought it would work. And, of course, I wasn't going to pass up, you know, one, you know what I considered a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity anyway. So I jumped all over it. What has been your favorite company to work for? Honestly, SWE, um, who uh, that Southern Wrestling Entertainment, who I currently work for, um, because you know I really have a vested interest in them, because um, you know they, you know I, I'm I'm helping with the book there, and um, you know I've you know do, done some promotional stuff with them, and uh, you know they've you know I've kind of got a different role now than I've had any at any other company. Uh, we put you know a couple twists on a few things, and. Um, you know, it's just, we have a good atmosphere in the locker room. You know, we make sure we don't have anybody that we think is going to create problems or, you know, have egos and, uh, you know, you know, it's just a, a fun place to be. We have a good time. So, you know, really that's, it's, it's been my favorite place to be, you know, it feels like, feels like family there, you know. What's been the worst company you've worked for? Worst company. Now that's a tough one. Because, you know, I, there's some, you know, places, spot shows I've worked through the years that I don't even know what the name of the company was. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you one was Pondo took me up to Lytic, Indiana. Um, this is in 98, I think. And took me up there for a little spot show, just, you know, a little indie to, you know, work for. And it was just drizzling shits. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it, you know, just disorganized and basically everybody in the locker room was you know a mark that should have been you know they should have bought a ticket to the <laughs> show not be you know and you know basically guys you know I take such an issue with guys who you know get in this business and don't invest in their gimmick yeah. you know to me guys that come out wrestling in jeans and t-shirts to me if you want to if you want to make a mark for yourself in, in the business you you do something to stand out. You do something to look different. Or at least that's why mm -hmm. I try to. I can't. Yeah. I kind of can't help but look different. But um, you know, guys that come out and you know, everybody wants to 
everybody looks like Raven. You know, Raven was able to get away with it because yeah. he, you know, he was the first one to kind of do that mm-hmm. and make it a, a regular thing. But when everybody else does it, they just look like the shits. You know, they look like, yeah, you, know, you know, no offense to back backyard workers, but you know, they all look like backyard workers. Yeah. What was it like getting to manage Dutch Mantel in a uh, car by Illinois? Awesome, awesome, and um, that match I did manage Dutch against Jerry Lawler. Um, and that was, uh, just, I think two years ago. And, but that, that, you know, that's definitely been a highlight of my career. Cause you know, um, I know you and I were talking, you know, before we started filming about Dutch and, um, you know, I can, I think I can actually call Dutch my friend. Um, you know, he and I, I, I managed him a few times and, uh, you know, we just kind of got to know each other and he, you know, whenever he'd come to the dressing room, he'd pull up a chair next to me and we'd just sit there and talk about wrestling or life in general and um so when and this is for Burt Prentice um Burt Prentice was a promoter so uh, when he brought Lawler in you know he told me you know I'm gonna put your Dutch and you're gonna work with Lawler and it was dream come true dream come true and you know I've, I'll probably never experience anything like that again let's get the story of you crowning yourself King P <laughs> oh wow well that was actually we did that to build up for uh, a show we were going to do in Shepherdsville and it was a legend show and in fact um, the idea was it was kind of built around Lawler as a matter of fact we, we went to the WWE we got Lawler booked and this is in November of 2012 um, and it was going to be me Managing Dutch again against Jerry. Yeah. We, you know, we were basically probably going to do the same match, you know. <laughs> well, we had a lot of fun doing it before. But, um, th- you know, we had that m- playing months in advance. So we started doing these little promos where, you know, I've seen other guys do it before. I couldn't help but do it myself. I've, you know, I thought, what a better way to build up with Lawler than start proclaiming myself the king. You know, give Lawler a reason to come in and, you know, take care of me, take care of Dutch, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, for me to say, hey, you know, Dutch Mantel's beat you more than anybody in this business, and I got Dutch, and this time we're going to put the king away because I'm the new king. Cool. Um, so we just started doing these little promos where I came out with a crown and come out to his music. Um, and, you know, a couple months before that show was going to take place, that's when Jerry had a heart attack. And obviously out of respect, you know, I, you know, I, I said, hey, you know, I even, I even went – one of the promos, and I said, out of respect to Jerry Lawler, I'm not coming out here with the crown anymore. You know, because, right. you, know, you know, he's you know, he's my hero. Right. <laughs> my wrestling hero. He's a lot of people's hero from this area. Yes, he is. I mean, like I said, you know, if, you, if you're around my age and you grew up here, you know, you tell everybody you watch Channel 3 wrestling. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all called it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, Watching Lawler all these years, it was just surreal to, you know, get to work with him. Right. You know, we were on a couple of shows together. Who are the top three guys you have enjoyed managing the most? Hmm. That is a hard, that is a hard question to answer because I've managed about 70 guys. Wow. Um, Pondo would be one because we always have fun. You know, there was... Pondo goes out of his way to make sure he makes me break character out there by making me laugh. Um, uh, Dutch would be another. Um, you know, just because, you know, we got to work old school. Right. Um, and we did a lot of the old school spots, you know, handing off the chain each other back and forth. Yeah. And um, probably, I would say Bull. Bull Payne would okay. be the other one because Bull was the first guy I was – regular manager for mm-hmm. in fact you know the very first night i managed i managed bull Payne against fly boy rock or rock you know that was my first night as a manager and you know what a you know i couldn't have asked for you know you know a lot of guys don't get to ever work with people like that and right. i was you know my first night in you know so me and bull you know just bonded uh you know we had a great time what's the most violent or bloodiest match you've witnessed <laughs> You're talking to a guy who was an IWA for two years, um, from the start, actually. Um, 
Well, violent, I can't really say for sure. Now, I can tell you to probably to, just the thing that I thought was just over the top completely. I don't know about violent, but it just to me is over the top is I think Ian Pondo and Ox Harley did a four corners of pain match. And I believe they had maybe thumbtacks in one box, um, barbed wire in another. One box had salt in it. No, it had rubbing alcohol, not salt. It had rubbing alcohol in it, and the fourth one had cactuses in it. And, you know, to me, I was just thinking, you know, what more can you, you know, I always thought, you're giving people too much too soon. You know, what, what can you do to top this other than shooting somebody in the head? Right. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, and they went out there and did it. And, of course, you think you're crazy as hell because they did. Um, but to me, that, that, that one stands out. Now, I mean, you know, they had plenty of matches that weren't necessarily gimmicked up as far as, you know, the, the, you know, the, the weapons they use, but, you know, I've seen plenty of, um, you know, Taipei death, you know, where they tape the fists up with bro broken glass, and, you know, I, I've seen Pondo and Ian, you know, have a couple of those, and, yeah. you know, they just beat each other to death, and, you know, you just wonder how they keep coming back, and the next week, get another one, I don't know. If you could manage any wrestler from the WWE or TNA right now, who would it be and why? Hmm. Who would it be and why? That's another tough question. And it's a tough question because I don't follow WWE and TNA so much necessarily. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess a guy like, I know he's, you know, He's kind of stale in a lot of people's minds, but a guy like Randy Orton, I think, would be along my my lines because, you know, tough kind of no nonsense guy. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think when when you're, you know, I I think the most effective heel manager to me is a little guy. You know, that's always you know that's why I always connected with Jimmy Hart. That's why I always, you know, um, because I think a little guy looks great next to a big guy. Uh, you know, big. I, mean, I, I think you know you kind of have that contrast, and you know it allows a heel manager to hide behind the big guy, and you know you can talk all your trash behind him, but you know no matter what, I'm always going to be hiding behind him. So you know, I, I think somebody like that would would have been more my style. Okay, this next question, uh, one of your buddies that you have worked with in the past, a couple of these questions come from different people. Okay. And this one is, let's talk about a hot car and a Cosby sweater. <laughs> oh, my God. Who did you get these questions from? I got to know. That, that's great. Um, these come from road trips. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer this politically correct. Uh, I don't guess I have to be politically correct. But there was one road trip. I bet this came from Jimmy. I bet this came from Jimmy Felcher. Um, I was on a road trip, well, a couple road trips to Tennessee where, you know, I, I think it was me, Cash, Cash Flow, um, Hardcore Gibson, and I can't remember who else was been riding with us, but um, somehow we got on the subject. I, I don't know how, how this even came, I can't remember the, the conversation we were having, where this all came about, but they were describing you know, like a perversion act, um, and they were describing it, and I said, oh, you mean a hot Carl, <laughs> because, uh, you know, we, I had seen this on, uh, I'd heard it mentioned before, you'd see it like an Urban Dictionary website, and, you know, they just thought it was so off the wall that I just, you know, just out of nowhere just blabbered, yeah, that's a hot Carl, and, or that, you know, that's, uh, what was the other one? What was the other one they mentioned? We, we had a lot of them. Uh, this was just the hot car and the Cosby sweater. The hot car and the, co <laughs> the Cosby sweater. <laughs> um, wow, how do I answer this? Um, hot car is the act of, and I, I've never done this, by the way. Let me just put that out there, people. I've never done this, but hot car is the act of wrapping saran wrap over somebody's face and then 
defecating on him. Um, so you can imagine why this was so hilarious to us. And then the <laughs> uh, Cosby sweater is the act of eating bowls and bowls of fruity pebbles or fruit loops or something colorful and then vomiting all over somebody on your chest. You say, I just made you a Cosby sweater because it's colorful and gaudy and I'm sorry for you. I I've, I've never done this. So. <laughs> I can't I can't attest to it either way. What's the most heat you've ever received? I I would say IWA. Um, you know that's that's funny because I was thinking about how much different the fans were back then than they are now. I mean, you still get heat with people, and you get different kinds of heat with different kinds of crowds. I mean, southern heat is different from hardcore heat, you know, because the hardcore heat, they're accustomed to violence. They're bloodthirsty. That's what they want. They want to see somebody's head come off, you know. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, that's what a hell of an environment to break in, you know, the rookie in. Um, but that's where I, I definitely got the most heat was IWA. Uh, because, you know, back then, those people were nuts. I mean, the heat to them was... They started calling in death threats to me on the IWA Mid South Hotline, <laughs> and uh, Ian would tell me about that and have a good laugh. <laughs> um, or they've, I've had chairs thrown at me, I've had light bulbs thrown at me, I've had coins thrown at me, I've had water and beer thrown at me, you know, various food. Um, you know, a lot of those people they just want to hurt you. They want to hurt you, and and you know they'd be out outside after the show is waiting for you to come out and. You know, that's why I never went out by myself. You know, I always made sure I went out with big guys. And, you know, nobody ever yeah. messed with me. But, you know, you know they, they sure let you know that, you know, don't come back or, you know, or else. Or <laughs> they're, they're some crazy sons of bitches, I'll tell you. But, you know, they're, they're different now. You, you know, wherever I'm a heel, you know, you can still get heat. But it's not, we want to kill you heat. It's just good old-fashioned. How did the pimp gimmick come about? Are you a real pimp, or is this just a gimmick? Tell us about it. I live my gimmick. I, I, <laughs> that's you what see, I that's why I got the coat on. Yeah. This is, I live the gimmick. Um, actually, um, you know, the whole Billy the P concept was, um, that, that was Ian's idea. You know, he, you know, he had this from the start. You know, the man, he told me, I want you to be my heel manager. I'm going to call you Billy the P. You're going to be doing a pimp gimmick. Um, he said, I want you to grow your hair out. We're going to dye it black. We're going to slick it back. Um, you're going to carry around a cane. And you're going to talk about all your bitches and hoes. And... <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, he, he had that concept down from the start. So, we, I mean, we we went through and did all that and more. Um, I didn't necessarily care for the, the jet black hair. I always wanted to have bleach blonde hair. And eventually, he, I told him, let me bleach my, my hair. Just something different. And, you know, that, that stuck. But, um... I mean, you know, that's, you know, he had that right off the bat, so it was interesting. Still is. After all the years of being in the business, uh, how do you get motivated to continue? It's hard to sometimes after that much time. Uh, you know, I, I took a long break for years and years. Um, you know, and, and I had people want me to come back and work this shot here or there. And I just, I, I never had any desire to for a long time. I just... Once I left IWA, I, I still did some different indies, um, you know, around Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana. Um, but, you know, I just kind of lost the fire. I think I was just worn out. And I think it was just, uh, you know, a whirlwind. Um, you know, because at one point we were working four times a week. And then you do a shot in Evansville or, you know, it, it, you know shots here and there, you know, because uh, Pondo would take me to a lot of indies with him. you know he wanted to get me any experience you know Ian had a problem with that you know Ian is is one of those guys that he doesn't want you working for anybody else he wants you working exclusively for him you know but he kind of let me bend the rules on that he let Pondo take me just so I get experience so um you know but but finally I just I think I kind of burned myself out I had to take a break um I got married you know so I, I stayed out for a few years or several years um but, you know, these days, motivate yourself. I think you just kind of have to lose yourself in thinking, you know, 
Uh, I just turned 40, so um, I kind of go out there. You know, it's going to sound corny saying this, but, you know, I kind of go out there and feel enough. What if this is the last time I ever work? What if this is the last show I ever do? You know, I'll, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with going out there with an idea. I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go out there and try to steal a show tonight. You know, I don't, I don't try to step on anybody's toes or anything like that, you know, but, you know, that, that motivates me is, you know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do this. You know, I could change, you know, right now I'm having a good time. Tomorrow I could save the hell of it. You know, take an air break. You never know, but that's how I'm motivated. All right, on this next question, I'm going to ask you about some guys in the business, and you just tell me what your thoughts are about them, okay? Okay. The first one is bull pain. Love them. I mean, um, you know, it's funny. I didn't find out till years later, um, and we laugh about this now, but um, like I said, bull's the first, um, you know, I mentioned on the first show I ever worked on. Um and you know, I've managed them every week for almost two years. Um, and we, you know, eventually had great chemistry together. But he told me years later, like I said, if, uh, he said, You know, do you realize? And he said, Do you realize that at first I did not like you at all? He said, I couldn't stand you, I resented you. And you know, it kind of came as a shock to me because he hid it pretty well. You know, I mean, he was tough on me. But I, I looked at it as paying dues and, you know, learning. You know, that's what you do with the vets. You know, you you say, yes, sir, thank you, sir, no, sir. You know, you know that's that's the way I was brought up in the business. And, um, but Bull told me later, he's like, he's like, I resented you. He said, I felt like you were just another goofball mark that's coming into this business and you're given a free ride. And he said, when I realized how hard you worked and how you know outside the ring you were paying your dues setting up shows promoting shows you know and you know setting up chairs in the arena every night and breaking them back down after a show and he's like you know once once i realized how hard you worked and how much dedication you're showing and how much you're you know uh, you know enjoying being my manager and working with other guys he said that's when i gained respect for you and you know that always meant a lot to me i you know like i said i was really kind of I guess I was just naive to it at the time, but you know, he swears he he hated me at first. <laughs> he just he thought I was going to be a thorn in the side. He thought he, you know, I was going to be dead weight. What about Pondo? That's um, you know, that's another one of my oldest friends in the business, and, and you know, like I was telling you a minute ago, um, Pondo, I think tried to do more to help me. Um, probably than anybody around that time because he wanted to take me all over the place. You know, he wanted to take me to the Indies with him. And we did. We did a lot of, um, you know, we did a lot of shots in Evansville. We worked in Evansville every week for some little offshoot company. It didn't have anything to do with IWA. But he took me all around. Uh, we worked spot shows everywhere. But he did get me the experience to, you know, you know, get me some extra money and, and just to have a good time because we had a great time together. You know, travel on the road Pondo, stay in hotels with Pondo. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of good times I, and I'd still, every time I see him, you know, you know, he, he makes me laugh more than anybody else in this world. You know, it's, it's never a dull moment with Pondo. So, you know, so to this day, he's still one of my best friends. What about Apollo? I love Apollo. Apollo's got, uh, Apollo's got so much, uh, kind of spirit to him and, and, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where, you know, again, at first we, you know, first time I managed him or first couple of times, maybe, you know, we were just kind of feeling each other out, just seeing what each other's style was. But we really, you know, after a period of time, we really started clicking together. And, and um, <laughs> we uh, we started calling ourselves A1 and Mayo. That's <laughs> what we started calling ourselves. And, um, um, you know, we have a great time together. Yeah, I, I've... I've worked all over the place with Apollo. I mean, we've been everywhere together, um, you know, over these last few years. And, um, you know, we just, you know, again, he's just a great guy. He's, he's fun to be around. And, um, you know, he's put his years in. You know, he's put his years in business, too. And, uh, you know, I can always learn something from, from Apollo every night, too. Cash flow. Again, I, I know it's, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but, but um, cash flow... You know, he means the world to me because, 
like I was telling you a little, you know, before we started the interview, um, cash flow, rolling hard, Harry Palmer and myself, um, we all basically broke into business at the same time. I, I was in, Rowan was in first. I was in just after Rowan and um, then Cash and then Harry Palmer came along later. But, you know, we, we, we all consider ourselves, you know, we, we kind of, I don't want to say we were a clique, but we called ourselves like the ghetto kids, you know, because we were the, we were the guys all on the bottom. You know, we were the guys breaking in the greenhorns, paying our dues and learning. And, um, you know, we, we all bonded over that. And, you know, I have no doubt if Rowan was still here today, he would still be doing it. And I know if, if Harry physically could do it, he would do it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that me and Cash can still keep working together. And, um, you know, I, you know, Cash works hard. He's, he's a great worker. You know, he really became a great worker over the years. And, um, you know, he's, he's got a good mind for the business. So, um, but yeah, you know, Cash and me, you know, had great road trips together. I mean, we make each other laugh like crazy. So, um, you know, Cash always, well, I have always be one of my best friends. He'll always have a soft spot with me. <laughs> what about RJ? RJ is a character. R.J. Douglas is a character. You know, he, um, you know, he's another one. We always have a good time. You know, you can just sit around and laugh. And, um, you know, um, you know, he's been at it for a few years, too. Uh, we've done a lot of um, angles together. Yeah, he's another one. We've worked in a few places together. We've done angles where he and I were brothers, um, and we were dual heel managers um, for cash uh, down in Tennessee. We did that a few times. And, um We've done heel versus heel, like my heel stable versus his heel stable, and uh, you know, we, we've done so we've done a lot of work together. Um, and we always, you know, you know he's he's from that same time period I am, where you know we both grew up on the same uh, ideas with Memphis. So you know we we don't have to really talk about stuff a lot. Then you know we know what each other's thinking is like, oh yeah, this would be great. You know, we can do this, and you know we just kind of agree on because that's. That's what we grew up with. That's what we wanted to do. You know. so. Lennox Norse. He's a hard worker. He's a hard worker, and he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life. Um, he's very humble. Um, and, you know, I've had a good time working with him. I managed him um, in PWF in Corbin, and we still work together all the time in SWE. Um, but, you know, we had, we had a little... A little bit of a fun run, you know, he is his manager in this, um, PWF, but um, he's a great guy, he's very soft-spoken, like I say, he's a very humble guy, you know, he, you know, I think he appreciates business, I think he wants to work hard, I think, you know, he's trying to make himself better all the time, and that's what I respect that. Jerry Lawler? <laughs> yeah, and that's, to me, he, he was the king, he still is the king. Um, you know, he was, you know, like a lot of, you know, like a lot of people all around the South, he was my hero. Um, to me, you know, one of the greatest talkers in the business. Um, you know, he never, was, he was never flashy as far as in-ring style. You know, he was just kind of a meat and potatoes guy, just kind of grinding it out. But he always, he could always, you know, he could take anybody, you know, he's, you hear about workers that have a great match of a broom. Well, well there's one of them. Yeah, and he can he can make psychology out of anything, and you know, I, it makes me mad when people say you know he put himself over because he was part you know owned part of the company all those years, but you know who else? I mean, who else was was up for a job? I mean, you know, he was on top for a reason. And anybody else that could do it would do it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So Dusty, you know, yeah. you know Dusty did it for years, and yeah, any Booker, I, you know. The Booker always tell you, oh, I don't put myself up, you know, nothing like that. But, you know, eventually it creeps in. <laughs> you know, but, you know, Lawler, obviously, you know, he switched up the book every six months or so with, with Jerry Jarrett. And, um, you know, he's phenomenal mind. Two, having those two minds, and then you throw in a Bill Dundee, who's creative as well, and you throw in a Dutch Mantel, who has a book once in a while. I mean, that's why everything stayed fresh for years. In Memphis um, you know after the glory years they started rehashing things but um you know they were very very creative back in that day 
And the last one is uh, Matt Douglas. Well, you know, um, you know, we did a lot of work together. Um, you know, we, we did, um, you know, when we were in Tennessee, we, we did a lot, a lot of these promos together. We, we had kind of our own little kind of web show. Yeah, I seen that. Yeah, uh, we did the, it was the Matt and Billy show, or I can't remember what it was called. Um, Never a Dull Moment. Yeah. That's what it was called. Yeah. Um, now, you know, the thing I will say is we had, I, I thought we had great chemistry, um, kind of doing that kind of stuff together. Um, you know, we never... We never talked about what we were going to do before we shot these promos. You know, we just we just winged it. You know, we just let the camera on and just yeah. went with it. And, you know, I thought we put, put a lot of good stuff out. But, you know, he had his own agenda. And, you know, it, it didn't really fit what I wanted to do or, you know, what, what I thought was right for me. So, you know, he went his own way. And, you know, he's down. He's still working for Burt down in Tennessee. But, um, you know, I don't. He doesn't have heat. You know, I don't have any crosswords to say about him, but just, you know, his interests and my interests are just different. Yeah. Who are some guys in the business uh, you dislike or you've had heat with in the past? You know, I've always been able to say I um, that I get along with 99% of the people I've ever worked with. For the most part. <laughs> for the most part. Um, but I can tell you, uh, one person that I do have issue with and, you know, I don't, I don't, I, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people that have legitimate heat with me, but the one that I'll, that will stand out for you know, probably the rest of my career will be Brian Christopher. And as much as I love his daddy, Brian Christopher is, uh, I just think a, a, a massive piece of shit. We'll uh, get, I'll, just, I'll just put that out there. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Okay. I hear you're good at doing Jimmy Valiant impersonations. Can, <laughs> can you show us one? Uh, it's been detailed on YouTube. I know yeah. that much. Oh, God. And that was Matt Douglas is doing, by the way. Um, I don't know. We just did stuff to entertain ourselves on road, road trips, me and Matt and Cash Flow. And I don't, you know, I can't remember what ever really started the whole Jimmy Valiant thing. I think just one day we were talking about him, and um, I just started into it, and it, it's become a running joke ever since then. I, I don't want, because you know, I, I respect Jimmy Valiant. I, I love the guy. You know, he's, you know, you know, he's one of the great, again, another one of the great talkers of all time. You know, he puts on his, you know, he just, he's like Dusty. You know, well, I can't really say that. You know, Dusty will, will have a lot of um, emotion, a lot of, you know, theory and logic behind a lot of his promos. But you know, he also got silly. But Jimmy was always silly. You know, just, um, but, yeah, so, so, you know, on some of these road trips to entertain ourselves, you know, we would be doing impressions and, and everybody just liked the Jimmy Valiant. And, you know, it was just basically a lot. Of, um, it was just a lot of, oh, massive baby, you know what I'm talking about, daddy. We're coming into NYC or we're coming into Mempo. I'm flying in on a 747, daddy. You better have that. You better have old Jimmy there, baby, because he's going to come in and, woo, he's going to kiss all the ladies and he's going to hug all the babies and kiss all the old ladies. He's going to kiss your grandma, baby. So... That's Jimmy, don't good. Jimmy, don't kill me when I see you. <laughs> I met Jimmy before, and you know, he's a nice guy, he's a fun guy. Yeah, you know, I, you know, like I said, he, you know, you know, he's in the ring. He's, you can say whatever you want to say, but he, he's got charisma out the yin yang. That's what everybody's gonna remember about him. He's an entertainer. What's been your favorite moment in your career so far? Definitely, I would go back to managing Dutch against Jerry Lawler. Um, you know, that, that to me is always going to, you know, because that meant a lot to me because, you know, well, that matches out on YouTube. And, um, you know, for me to be able to say, hey, it's out there forever. You know, you know, it, it's documented. And, you know, I, I was, I, you know, a proud moment for me was being able to show my mom and my dad and my brother, look at this. Can you believe this? You know, because me and my brother would wrestle when we were kids and we want to be like Lawler or Nundy. Um, and so... When I, you know, I just kind of reflect back on that and then think of all these years later, here I am standing across from Jerry Lawler, and, and Jerry Lawler gets on the microphone and 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 just runs me down. It's just, it was just classic. It was just classic. But you know, I uh, another moment I I would really put up there too would be um, 
of getting to work on the first Brian Pillman memorial show um, for Les Thatcher in 1998. Um, and that was a huge deal at the time. Um, because that's when he had Stone Cold, um, you know, he had Steve Austin as the, the MC of the whole night. Um, and that's when Steve was at his peak. Yeah. I mean, so that was a big deal. And, um, you know, he had Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho and Al Snow and Sonny and, you know, just, it was an all-star show. Um, so getting to work on that, I managed Bull against, uh, against Flash Flanagan. Um, and they actually broke the ring on a superplex. <laughs> they got a lot of heat for that. Because yeah. uh, <laughs> they had to take about 30 minutes to fix some boards on the ring. But, um, um, that, that was a, a phenomenal moment. So, um, I'll always remember that too. But, but Lawler and Dutch, I, I'd still put number one. Always will. What do you think is the biggest problem in the Indies right now? Anybody can get in. Anybody can get in the door. You, you can, you can throw, well, you can throw a pair of jeans and a t-shirt on your grandpa and put them out in the ring. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know. But the problem is, well, it's not as bad in Kentucky. Because in Kentucky, you have to be licensed. And, you know, it's not as easy for anybody to just walk in the ring. Um, you know, because, you know, Tim Gonnerman, who's the uh, KBWA, um, you know, commissioner, he's the guy that goes around at all the shows in Kentucky. And, you know, watch, you know, he's the he's a watchdog. And I love you, Tim. And I've known Tim ever since I broke into business. Um, but, you know, that makes it harder for just anybody to walk in. Uh, but to me, it's just, you know, you know, like I said, I, I, the thing I take issue with, you know, I, I don't take issue with anybody that wants to be in a wrestling business because I was the same way and people probably had the same problem with me, but you know, um, I always knew that if you want to catch somebody's eye or you want to get somebody's attention, you better, you better invest in your gimmick. You better you know, go out there thinking that you're living your gimmick. Um, there's just too many people out there that just go in there with jeans and t-shirts and tennis shoes and, and then that you, of course, they're the, the drizzling shits when you watch them. Um, but also, uh, I mean, what, what goes along with that is you have these people that, that come in they're untrained and, uh, in a lot of cases and, um, or trained by people who have no business training anybody, um, that will work for free. Um, on, on shows. So promoters obviously are going to go for the lowest payroll. They're going to book these guys. Like, oh, hell, they're willing to go out there and, you know, throw themselves in, in pits of barbed wire for nothing. Mm -hmm. Why should we pay a, a madman Pondo or a necro butcher? You know, so that cuts in a lot of legitimate trained workers. Uh, you know, that cuts into our bookings. And, um, you know, that hurts the business and because not only are you putting on you know, a, a questionable product, but you're you're taking away from guys who, you know, a lot of them do this for a living. This is the only job they do. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. What do you enjoy most about the business? Um, well, I've always been a ham. You know, I, you know I've always been a social butterfly. So going out there and, and uh, you know, going out there and just being outrageous or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, I have a lot of fun with that. You know, I've never had a problem with, you know, stage fright or being in any kind of spotlight or anything like that. Um, but, you know, it's also the camaraderie. You know, like I said, you, you, you know, there's not a whole lot of friend, guys you can call your real friends in the business. And you'll you hear that all the time. But, you know, the ones you do have that you can call your friends, you know, a lot of those are just, you know, you form these bonds, you go on road trips together, you work all over the place together. And to me, the camaraderie is a big thing. I, you know, I, I love, um, you know, I love being able to just hang out with my buddies. And because not only are you getting to work and not only are you, you know, having fun, but you're hanging out with your friends too, a lot of your buddies. Do you think the art of being a manager is dying? Because I don't see too many good managers anymore. I, the problem is, at least on a, um, on a mainstream level, it's been dead for years. Yeah. You know, the problem is, you know, and I always tell people, I said, I, I was either, I, however you want to put it, I, I was born 10 years too late because I think if I, if I could have been in the business 10 years earlier, that would have been more on my line <laughs> because, you know, that's when managers were everywhere and that's when you had 
you know, the um, territories and, and managers could get work everywhere. Um, but, you know, the days where you have like a WWE, when they had Bobby Heenan, Jimmy Hart, Oliver Humperdinck, Slick, you know, and then, you know, somewhere else you'd have Gary Hart, Skandor Ekbar, and, um, you know, those days are gone. Yeah. Um, you know, Paulie's Paulie's kind of last of a of a breed out there. Um, you know, at least of, of that that generation. Um, the problem is people are too used to you know they. You know, on WCW and WWE, you know, I, and I'm not putting down the divas in any way, shape, or form. You know, I, I respect them. They go out there and earn, you know, and, and train hard, and they earn their position. But, you know, the problem is a lot of people started saying, we don't need managers. We'd rather put eye candy out there for guys. And that took a lot of managers, you know, they put them on the shelf. It sucks. It, you know, and, you know, when, you know, guys like Jimmy Hart, you know, Jimmy Hart, you look at him now, he looks exactly the same as he did 30 years yeah. ago. And I have no doubt he could still go out there and be Jimmy Hart. But, you know, he, he can't get any work now except, you know, an indie shot here or there. You know, just he, he's just a novelty act now. He's, you know, just a legend show. But, you know, I, you know, I always, you know, because people ask me, you know, I don't know, he might even ask me, but, you know, who I think the best manager, of, um, you know, in the history of business. Well, you know, I would say, for consistency through years, I'll say Bobby Heenan. Um, yeah, that's who I, you know, modeled myself a lot after. Um, but I think from about 1981 to 1984, I don't think there was a better manager than Jimmy Hart uh, in Memphis. I mean, basically by the time he got to the WWE, he was just kind of, you know, they weren't letting him be Jimmy Hart yeah. because Jimmy Hart was phenomenal, phenomenal uh, back in the glory years of Memphis. And once he left, I mean, you watch that Memphis Heat documentary about memphis you kind of laugh because when when jimmy hart leaves and when they when they document him leaving that's when the documentary ends and it kind of makes you feel like well what are you saying when jimmy hart left uh, that was the end of the territory well it was the end of the, the glory years though so you know they they went on for years and years but you know they they of course jimmy Cornette came out of there and um paul e came through there and a lot of other guys that weren't around very long but they can never Never recapture the magic of Jimmy Hart. Is it true you were stripped down to your underwear in Carrollton, Kentucky by Nurse Betty? Yes, it was. That was true. That was a rib on me, too. <laughs> um, yeah, that was old Chet. Chet Robbins. Um, you know, Chet... Uh, Chet, you know, we'll, we'll work as a, you know, he, he does little dual things where... You know, he'll come out under, he's supposed to be female wrestler. Or that's the, that's the idea of Nervous Betty. But it's, it's Chet. And, um, he and I have had some fun with that. Um, but yeah, we were in Carrollton. Um, and we just, we were supposed to do a deal where Betty was just going to come out there and basically run me off. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't really anything planned as far as anybody's going to strip my clothes off me. But that's what ended up happening. And, you know, I you know the the tricky part was just making sure the underwear stayed on. <laughs> that was the tricky part, but you know, fortunately they did, and I I managed to scoot under the ring until and I said, you know, Matt Douglas is out there doing the interview. I said, go back there and get me a goddamn towel. <laughs> and and finally they sent somebody out with a towel. I, you know, I said, I'm not coming out of this ring until you or from, from under this ring until you bring me a towel. Right. And I, I was making it sound like part of the part of the promo but I, that was that was shoot i was i was pissed at him i was pissed at him because i'm sure he had something to do with this yeah you know, because let's see what happened. <laughs> which town has the best fans hmm i you know louisville has great i you know every, everywhere has good fans um you know when you think about IWA, you think of rabid, uh, devoted fans. You know, people that go to the tr trouble of making weapons and, and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, to, to me, everybody has good fans. Uh, I can't really say one was better than the other. But um, 
I always enjoyed working here. I always enjoyed the fans here. I still do. Um, I enjoyed the fans throughout Tennessee, you know, because I worked a lot of places in Tennessee, and that's where you get your that's where you get your more old school fans. Um, so you're getting, you know, they they'll buy more into, you know, some of the, you know, heel tricks, and and you know they'll give you more heel heat than because what I what I call in IWA Mid South back in the day, I called that more smart heat because there were a lot of smarts out in the audience, and you know heat to them wasn't, hey ref, you know he pulled out a chain or he's got a chair or you know something like that. It's more like, uh, you know, who, you know, it, it just it, a bunch of smart people thinking they're going to expose, you know, not playing along with, um, you know, not playing along with the, the whole idea. Um, you know, it's more of they just want to critique everything to death, you know, pick you apart on the internet, you know, that, and that to me is part of what's killed indie wrestling too. Who are some guys in the business you could call your real friends? Bull, definitely. Pondo, definitely. Cash, definitely. Um, Hardcore Douglas. Um, you know, th those are probably my closest friends. Um, you know, and I, and I have a lot of friends. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to leave anybody out. I, I would say Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Felcher. Um, you know, I consider him one of my yeah. best friends. And, you know, I have, a, I, have, I have a lot of people I can call friends. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to leave anybody out. But, you know, those are guys I, I talk with on a regular basis mm -hmm. or work with on a regular basis. So, What's your thoughts on hardcore wrestling? Well, <clears throat> I think it had its place years ago um, off the heels of ECW um, but I think you know and, you know for me I and I was I entered the business straight into the birth of the IWA Mid-South and so I, like I said I, I joked about that, that what, what a hell of an environment to you know for a greenhorn to be in and brought up in but in a way I think it was kind of good because Hell, after that, and everything else seemed like a piece of cake. You know, you, there was nothing fans could do to ring crazier in these hardcore shows. But the problem is, I think with IWA and CZW and um, you know places like that, that, you know, that fueled more on on hardcore stuff. I, I think they just there's only so far you can go. There's only so far you can go, and you know, I still think Ian gave everybody too much too soon. He might even admit that himself, but you know, there's like I said, when you have cactus out there, or you have the what was the thing, Pondo? What was the one match you did? The spider web of death, or something, the spider web of barbed wire, whatever it was. When you have guys falling, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet into a spider net of barbed wire, where do you go from there? I mean, there's nothing you can do to, that will surprise anybody short of cutting your head off. You know, and to me, it's just, it, it's just too, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's sloppy. To me, it's just Bush League now, yeah. uh, you know, when there was a, when there was a rhetoric to it and when there was logic, if you can call it logical, but I think it's just, it got out of hand. I think it's, uh, you know, I think for the most part, it's played out. You know, I, I don't know what else you can do. I don't know where else you can go without killing somebody in the middle of the ring. I don't, they practically have. All this was stuff like that. Yeah, you, know, you see Pondo, his head, it looks like Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that, uh, you know, uh, I'm just joking, but, you know, Pondo's head is, it looks like he was in a car wreck. You know, it looks like somebody had to put half his skull together. And, and you know, I love Pondo, but, you know, that's, that's irreversible. You know, you can never go back and take that back. You know, that, to me, that's a big problem. You know, that, that, and, and guys that do hardcore stuff almost exclusively, those are guys that end up having a lot of problems. And and those are guys whose careers, you know, are cut short more often than not. Tell us about <clears throat> doing promos in Subway and White Castle. Yeah, like I said, this is, um, that was all part of um, just stuff to amuse ourselves on road trips. Um I don't know, it, and that, that all ties back into the Jimmy Valiant thing too. Well, we we'd stop at a subway, and and they say, "Hey, Billy, go up, go up there and, and um, do the 
do the Jimmy Valiant thing to, you know, girls working at the counter in Subway. You know, so I do it, and, you know, they'd start filming it, and, you know, we'd have a few good laughs, and, you know, fortunately, more often than not, the, you know, whoever was working there in the restaurant, you know, they, they would play along with it, you know, they'd come out and have fun and dance, and <laughs> it was just stupid shit, you know, I mean, just, like I said, we were just amusing ourselves, yeah. so, um, I don't know, it was good times. Okay, what happened with you and Brian Christopher down in Tennessee? Well, um, we were in Selmer, Tennessee, I think it's which is pretty close to Memphis. Um, and this is show for Burt Prince. And, you know, I, I had known Brian for years. We'd always gotten along. We'd always kind of almost, like, worked it worked around other people like we had heat with each other but we we were just we we're just working yeah we we're just having fun um now the funny thing is i had worked with brian i had managed brian about two maybe two weeks before this happened um i managed him against uh abyss from tna um in another town in tennessee and we, we had a good time we had, went out there and had some fun and you know everything seemed cool now you fast forward to two weeks and we were in selmer they, Brian was just in a mood that night to begin with, and I, you know, now, I can go back and tell you that this happened a few days after Jerry had a heart attack, and Brian had been up in Montreal where Jerry was in the hospital, you know. so after this happened, a lot of people were telling me, well, maybe Jerry was just, or uh, maybe Brian was just stressed out from what happened to Jerry, I don't know, well, you know, that's no excuse, but anyway, I'm not getting ahead of myself, um, Jerry, um, there we go again. Brian was working with Kevin White, who was you know, kind of a Tennessee guy. I think Bill Dundee trained him. Um, they wanted me to do a run-in at the end of the match where I'd come out. The plan was I was going to come out, toss a chain to, well, we were going to do the deal where I was going to toss the chain to Kevin White, but it was supposed to go over his head. Brian was going to catch it. Brian, you know, it, this is after a ref takes a bump. Brian was going to get a hold of the chain. He was going to knock Kevin out. And I was going to try to jump in. And Brian, I think he's supposed to give me a net shot. And then I would powder out of the ring. And then the ref would count him out. Brian goes over. That was the idea. So they were going to go about 15 minutes. Now, in this in this high school in Selmer, um, the, dressing, the dressing room door where he came out, it was right in the middle of the, of the whole place. Now, if people had seen me just standing at the door, you know, and this is my rationalize. If people just see me stand at the door, they know you're going to do a run-in. You know, especially if you're still in your, your gimmick. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just, I would peek out, you know, just every little bit. Um, and it just so happened at that time, Bert came around and was giving us all our, you know, our payoffs. So, you know, Bert came up and said something to me and gave me my payoff. I, you know, I, walk in and put it in my bag. Well, next thing I know, as I'm doing that, Kevin Wright's, Kevin White is running into the dresser and going, where are you? Where, where were you? You're making us look like a bunch of idiots out here. And where's the chain? He grabs the chain from me and runs out, runs back out, does our deal. Well, let me, it's only five minutes into this match. They were supposed to go about 15. Mm -hmm. So they started taking this match home in five minutes or so. It hadn't been that four or five minutes. So, they go out there and do whatever they do. And next thing I know, you know, I just think, oh, God. You know, because Brian was, like I said, in the mood to begin with. He was, you know, he, he was on whatever he was on. And, you know, steroid rage or whatever the hell he was doing. Um, but Brian comes in. And, you know, okay. I'll fall on the sword. I'll, I'll say, hey, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I wasn't there, and I apologize. I was going to tell him this as he came in the door. Well, as he came in the door, he, I didn't even get a chance to get a word out of my mouth. He came up and punched me right in the side of the head. And as I was falling back, he clocked me again. He got me twice in the same motion as I was falling back. And, um, of course, he was screaming, cussing, carrying on. You idiot, you idiot, you know, you screwed this up you did this and and you know you made us look like a bunch of idiots out there and you know 
so he just started wearing me down. Well, you know, like I said, you know, it knocked me to the floor. Um, the worst part of that, really, was just I kind of fell on my elbow a little bit, catching myself. That was the worst part of it. But I got right back up. And, um, you know, just to show him. Yeah. I took your best shot, and I got right back up. Right. Well, uh, you know, because I knew, hey, I, I can't fight the guy. I know better than that, you know. And, you know. <laughs> it's not like I, I could take Brian. Yeah. You know. Um, so, you know, and I... And I I, I go back thinking later. You know, I was in a dressing room full of guys. But, you know, these, you know, big guys too. You know, some of these guys work around the Tennessee Indies. And I was thinking, wow, you know, not one of them. Not a single one of them had the guts to stand up and say something. The only one that did, actually, was Matt Boyce. Who, um, you know, he's one of Bert's guys. Matt Boyce, but he's a, he's a smaller guy. But Matt was kind of coming over to check. I mean, even Brian, and then Brian started giving him shit too. You know, just for coming over to make sure I was okay. And, of course, everybody else is staying back watching and all. And, you know, I'm thinking, you, you bunch of chicken shit. You know, not, not a single one of you. You know, there was no, you know, none of my regular guys, my, none of my regular kind of guys that travel with her there. No, there was no cash flow. There was no Steve-O. Um, guys that, you know, I would think would stick up for me. So, you know, I can't really expect too much from them. But still, um, so... Brian's carrying on. I, I, I'd, I'd sit down. I just, I'm not looking at him. I'm just listening. And I'm just not saying anything. And then finally he says, why, why don't you just grab your shit and leave? Just go. Just leave. We don't want you back here. He said, if I ever see, if I'm ever on a show again where I see you in the dressing room, I'm walking out. I'm leaving. I'm never going to be in the same building with you again. I'm like, well, good. <laughs> um, and, and again, like I said, we just worked together two weeks before this. and had a great time laughing and having a good time but um now also another side point of this is uh Bert wasn't in a dressing room at the time Bert was out at the gimmick table and that's where he spends 90% of the show you know he was constantly trying to sell shit um so Bert didn't see any of this he wasn't witness to this um so I just went out you know, because that particular day myself Matt Douglas Bert and somebody else had traveled together I can't remember who else we, we all traveled together to that show. Um, so I went on out to the van, Matt Douglas' van. I went on out to the van and just hung out until, you know, because it was the last match. It was the end of the show. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just sitting there thinking, oh, God, you know, this is bullshit, you know. And you know, just started thinking of, well, you know, who's, who am I going to have heat with now besides Brian? And, who you know, how what's the trickle-down effect? You know, everything like that has a trickle-down effect. But. Um, you know, Matt and Bert came out. Matt, uh, you know, they told Bert before they came out, obviously, what happened. And, um, you know, of course, Bert, when he get out there, he said, it's okay. He said, hey, you know, I've, he said, Lawler hit me before. And, you know, Lawler punched me and shot on me before for screwing up. And, you know, I, mean, I still feel like I didn't necessarily screw up. You know, they took that match home 10 minutes early. Yeah. And, you know, so, um, Bert said, we're going to take care of this. He said, I'm going to make sure. He said, I'm going to, he said, I have Brian booked on some other shows coming up. I'm going to take him off those shows. He said, well, we'll take care of it. He said, don't worry. Because Bert really did, you know, I, I don't have anything bad to say about Bert because he really did give me a good opportunity. I mean, he, you know, he really liked me, liked my gimmick. And, you know, he, we were, we were building up to doing a big thing for me against him. We were eventually going to, you know, um, where he just finally got sick of me, and then he wanted to challenge me to a match. So, you know, he wanted to build up to that. But, you know, I think it was, it wasn't the next day, it was the day after. Or, yeah, the show was on Saturday. Bert texted me on Monday. And um, he said, hey, I'm going to give you a couple weeks off if that's okay. Right. Obviously, I knew what that meant. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was done. Um, so, you know, I, the guys had a relationship with Bert for years, or with, uh, Jerry Lawler for years, so, you know, it only makes business sense. Who are you going to side with? You're going to side with Jerry Lawler's kid? Yeah. And jeopardize, or, or you know, or are you going to side with Billy P and jeopardize your relationship with Jerry Lawler? Yeah. Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. So, I mean, I, I don't begrudge him for that. I understand 
business wise and personally why he did that but you know I still think I got the short end of that deal by a mile but you know I, I you know Brian he'll have a receipt out on him eventually you know, but, you know there are a lot of guys that know about it well even more now but there are people that are pissed off there are people that know about it, and there's people that you know, are going to keep that in mind. Now, you were telling me earlier that you had a Marty Jannetty story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jimmy Jimmy loves this story. He asked me to tell it, like, once a month. Um, <laughs> yeah, we booked them one time in IWA Mid-South. Um, and this is, well... Marty obviously is quite a reputation as a party guy. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I was down to building early that day, IWA building. We had a we had a phone number landline down there, you know, in case anybody called, because um, not everybody had a cell phone back then. But Marty called. I was the only one in actually in the office at the time. Marty called and said, "Hey, you know," he sounded like he'd been going from the moment he got out. And this is probably about two o'clock in the afternoon, and Marty was like, "Hey, man, can you you know tell me you know what what's fun to do around town?" It was it was in the summertime, so I was like, "Well, you know, are you, if you're just looking to kill some time, I said, you know, there's Kentucky Kingdom and um, what's his amusement park, old amusement park here, you know, and you know, I'd tell him a few other things around town that he could do to kill time." And he's like, "Okay, man," and, you know. So we we talked for a few minutes, and and then. So it's, here comes showtime, and we had a big show that night. It was uh, we were in the middle of this whole thing of NWA in New Jersey, where they were invading us. And, well, Marty was supposed to be one of our, our equalizers. <laughs> um, so you know, Marty, you know, time goes by. We're into the first match. We're into the second, third match, fourth match. No Marty. Nobody get a hold of him. You know, we we were calling the cell phone. Nobody, you know, he wasn't answering. So finally. I think Marty was on like fifth or sixth that night. We had a lot of matches that night, and we always did night OJ. But um, Marty finally shows up like two and a half hours into the show. And we've been pushing his match back and back and back. And finally, you know, he came. He was just, well, you can imagine. He was just drunk off his ass yeah. or whatever he'd been doing. Well, you know, he came in, and, and you know, Ian was like, Marty, Get your ass, we gotta get you out there. And we you know, we gotta get your match out. And um he he, I, he was working um Harley Lewis that night, who's a um indie worker up in New Jersey. And um, you know, Ian wanted him to go about 10, 15 minutes. Here we go on match times again. Um but <laughs> so Marty goes out to the ring. He's just probably doesn't even remember going out to the ring. So they get they get their match going. Two minutes into the match, they took it home. They start ringing a bell, and Ian is just ballistic, just going ballistic. He can't believe he paid the money he paid Marty to come in and he works a two minute match. <laughs> so he well. Ian was just going berserk. And um, when Marty got back to the back, and you know, just Ian was just, what was that? What was that? What were you doing? Why did you? Do? Mm -hmm. And Marty is like, oh, you know they. Were, he said we were buying it. We they were buying what we were doing. We just thought it was time to take it home. Just, you know, he just he just wanted to get the hell out of there, obviously. But um, uh, Marty ended up. Well, he left in such a hurry. He left his he left his gear behind, and um, <laughs> and the way Ian is, and we all, you know, a lot of us know, um, Ian figured the best way to make his money back from Marty was go out there and auction his gear off the next week to to the crowd. I don't know how much he got out of it. I can't remember. But so anyway, Marty was missing his gear, and some fan ended up with him the next week at IWA. <laughs> so that was Marty's only appearance in IWA. Now you work? Did you work with uh, Gangrel or Vampire Warrior? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You worked with him, right? A couple times, IWA. Uh, so I think it was Jimmy was telling me. That you worked with him or Sherry or something? Uh, yeah, I worked, well, Sherry Martell was, uh, you know, going back, that's, you know, when you're a manager, you don't get training, per se. You just have to learn it. You're just on the fly. You yeah. just make the shit up. You go along, you know, if, if you have the 
you know, knowledge of, you know, going back and, you know, my theory was always just go out there and do what you, what you know, and just go out there and emulate what you've seen from Bobby Heenan, Jimmy Hart, whatever. Those were my favorites. Um, but Sherry actually came in. Uh, I actually picked her up from the airport. The first time she came in, we just hit it off immediately. We just clicked like that. And me and Sherry became real good friends. We, you know, whenever she'd come to town, we traveled together. You know, she, she sent me an invitation to her wedding. I didn't go. I, I couldn't go, but, you know, that, I mean, that's how much she thought of me. Um, but we were very, very close, and we traveled a lot together. But Sherry also took the time to, you know, help me with my gimmick. She tried to, you know, she was teaching me psychology, you know, and, and giving me ideas for my gimmick. She, oh, we, we ought to spike your hair up and put gel in it and, she, you know, she one thing she, she suggested was put a lot of cologne on. She said, just douse yourself in cologne. That's what Jimmy Hart used to do. And people, you know, that way, so when you walk by Marcy, you go, oh, man, you smell terrible. And, you know, just, just little, little, you know, stuff you wouldn't think of, you know, unless you've been around a long time. And I was still, I was still pretty green. So, you know, and when, when Sherry had come to town, every couple of weeks, she'd even bleach my hair for me. You know, I'd go over to her hotel and just, sit there and bleach my hair and we'd hang out and <laughs> I mean she took a vested interest I mean that's you know I felt so lucky yeah. so fortunate to have that kind of relationship with her and you know I was you know that you know of all the you know I've worked with a lot of people that are, that are gone now but you know Sherry's still the one that hurts the most mm -hmm. to me did you go to her funeral or no no mm -hmm. no but you know I met her I met her husband she brought him up here when they were still engaged and I traveled in Evansville one time, and, you know, just Sherry let me into her life a lot, you know, so, you know, she, in fact, the, the first pair of, like, s stretchy spandex pants I had were, were a pair of Sherry's. Mm -hmm. She gave them to me, and I had those for a long time, so, they fit me, they fit me perfectly. <laughs> What's one word that describes Billy the Pig? Wow. Dumbass? <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. Charm. I did charm. <laughs> uh, charisma. I mean, that's, that's what I try to pride myself in, is that I'm not the best looking guy, I'm not the best worker, I'm not the best manager, but, you know, I'm going to go out there and give the 110 percent, I'm going to give effort, maybe effort's the word I mean, but, um, you know, that, I just, you know, I've always said, if I can go in there, if, that's where I get to a point, for, if I feel I need to take a break or step away, is if I feel like, I, I just don't have it in me to go out there and give 110%. If I don't feel that way, if I, if I don't feel I can give 110%, that's when I know I need a break, or I'm burned out, or I, you know, maybe it'll be time to hang it up, but, you know, I'm always going to work my ass off, no matter who it's for, no matter how many people are out there. Um, and, I mean that's that's something I that that's that's the part I take pride in most, or I try to. So, you be the judge. Huh? <laughs> What's your all-time favorite pro wrestling moment as a fan? Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee lose their Leaves Town match, nineteen eighty-three, in Memphis, because they built that thing up so huge. I mean, I just I still remember that clear as a bell when I was a kid watching it on TV. And of course, you know, it happened in Memphis, and we didn't find out about whatever happened in Memphis until next week, because they, they staggered the, the, the tape from you know, a week between Memphis, Louisville, Evansville. So, you know, the, to see Lawler go over, and, and that's great, because it was back in the day, you know, before the internet, before somebody else ruined it for you, you know, spoilers. Um, you know, so just go out there and think thinking, you know, is Lawler going to lose? Is he going to leave town? Is Dundee going to lose? And I love them both, you know. They were both awesome. And that still stands out to me. That's still, as a fan, that's still my favorite match. Because they they worked a phenomenal match that, you know, that's selling it out. And they were just incredible. And they were great in the day. You know, Bill Dundee is one of the most underrated workers uh, yeah, of all time. One of the most underrated heels of all time. You know, if he... I know he spent some time in NWA and WCW, but you know if, if if he had had more national exposure back when he was at his best, I think he would have been right up there with anybody. 
when you retire, how do you gonna be remembered? Like I said, I want you know people to remember me as being entertaining. I want them to be able to say, "Well, he was a little shit," or you know, he, he was a pain in the ass, or he pissed me off so bad. But you know, whatever it's or if they say I'm the shits or whatever, they can say whatever they want to say. But as long as they say I was entertaining, at least I was fun to watch. That's what I want. Now, now you know, if if that's my legacy, then I've done it right to me. You know, I don't. You know, I've like I said, you know, I'm just I'm not even a blip on the radar in, in wrestling history. Never will be. But, you know, to the people that have seen me and you know, and the and the you know, more importantly to me is the you know, people I've worked with, you know, my peers and you know, if they if they remember me as being a hard worker and if the fans remember me remember me as being somebody entertaining that they look forward to seeing, then you know, that that's a good legacy for me. That's how I want to be remembered. Well, I appreciate you doing this interview with me, man. Uh, I think you're a better manager than you give yourself credit for. Uh, <laughs> you got any last words or anything you want to say to your fans? Um, thank you for the support. Um, you know, thank you to all the people that have bought a ticket to watch me. And, you know, you know yeah, not that anybody's come to watch me specifically, but all the people that have bought tickets over the years and come out and whether you love me or hated me, you know, either way, I had fun. And um, I hope you guys will keep coming out. Um, I don't know. When, do you know when this is going on? This will be on you, Friday. This will be on Friday. Well, this Saturday, March 29th, um, SWE will be in Hillview, Kentucky, and we have Jerry Jarrett coming in. Um, kind of an old Memphis appreciation night. Um, Jerry will be doing a seminar earlier in the day with us. So March 29th, Saturday, anybody in the, um, anybody in the area? I went out to see Jerry Jarrett, see um, you know, see our, our regular crew. Um, we, I think we put on a great show. I think we, we put one, you know, I, I think we put on a show that will remind people, you know, maybe of the older days of wrestling. You know, that's that's at least that's try, you know, what we strive for. So, um, you know, but all the fans, past, present, future, thank you very much. You've made it. It's been a great ride. You know, if 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 I decide, to, you know, retire tomorrow, then. I can't. I don't have. I don't have any complaints. I don't have any regrets. You know. You know. Like I said, I have a lot more good memories and bad memories. So, and that's part to the fans. So thank you, and thank you very much for having me on. Anytime, man. Thanks again, buddy. Not a problem. Thanks for having me.